We will uh, get started here in just a moment. Um, we actually um, have, we went above and beyond since this is our fourth session, our last session for this series, our Cultivate Wellness uh, series. We went above and beyond. We have four giveaways tonight. And so we have Emotional Intelligence 2.0 and then um, Building a Non-Anxious Life by John Deloney and Dr. John Deloney. So those are going to be good. And we're going to have an impactful session tonight. Has anyone been enjoying the other sessions that we've had? Absolutely. So I am so thankful that as a church we're able to do this. Uh, I know that uh, this is a, uh, it has helped me, if no one else, all these sessions. And if you're raising a toddler, then you definitely need some emotional help. And so I was hoping that tonight would give me some answers to something. <laughs> you should have gotten a handout. Is anyone missing the handout for tonight? Everyone's got one so far? Okay, great. Um, and then they uh, will have a stack at the back. So if someone comes in and they're trying to steal yours, you'll be like, hey, look, it's at the back. So, <laughs> uh, But we're going to get started here momentarily. But let's just, before we do, let's just say a word of prayer over this session that God would really speak to us and minister to us tonight. Can we do that? Lord, I pray right now, God, that you would meet with us tonight. God, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would give us tools in our toolbox to be able to uh, help ourselves, Lord, be better and to do exactly everything that you have us to do, that we would become everything that you would have us become and to help others as well, Lord. In your precious name, I pray right now, God, let this, let your spirit come down and work in the middle of what we're going to be doing tonight. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Well, this is our fourth and final session. This is our, uh, we're going to be talking about emotional, uh, mental health, emotional health and wellness. And Dr. Chelsea Hall has so graciously come all the way from California, I believe, to, uh, to speak to us. And um, she is a licensed psychotherapist, if I said that correctly. There's therapists and then there's psychotherapists. So if you're a psychonaut, <laughs> you might can get help tonight. <laughs> we were joking in the back before. We were like, okay, so if we have multiple personalities, which personality gets help tonight? But anyway, but um, so anyway, so she is an accomplished person. Uh, she has a degree, a doctoral degree and, uh, in ministry and counseling. Um, general, she has a very lengthy LinkedIn uh, accomplishment here, but a doctorate of ministry um, and with a focus in pastoral counseling and congregational health, uh, congregational care uh, from Bethel Seminary in St. Paul. And uh, she has helped many, many people over the course of her career uh, to become better, better themselves and to become better people. And, but more importantly, as much as you know, we like accolades and we pursue education and all those things are great, but she is an apostolic. And uh, everything she does, she does being led by the Spirit of God. And so when you take a education, a degree, you take science, you take worldly wisdom, and you combine that with the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost, you become someone that can really make a difference in people's lives. And so that's the speaker that we have tonight, someone who's going to help us tonight. So Dr. Hall, if you would come, why don't we give her a hand of appreciation as she comes, and let's enjoy this session tonight. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is such an honor to be here with all of you. I'm really excited about this topic. Emotional wellness is something that is so essential to all of our health and well-being in every way, but especially spiritually. You know, it's very easy for us to get busy and sidetracked, even about the work of God, and forget to pay attention to some of the inner work. So tonight, hopefully, we'll be able to share a little bit more about how you can do that without further losing yourself in the stress and the activity and the work. So before we go forward, I just want to say what a beautiful campus this is. It's, it's amazing. It's the first time I've been able to come. And you're already building more. And I can't wait to see what that looks like the next time. I want to give honor to the Haley's for their kindness and support and for just running something that's so amazing. I will also have to, if I ever need a pep talk, I'm going to have to come talk to you because the way you put that introduction was really nice. Is that me? <laughs> um, but I also want to give honor to Pastor and Sister Adams for their amazing leadership, not just here at your church, but everywhere they go, they bring kindness and wisdom and they take time for everyone. So thank you both. 
And of course, I want to give honor to my pastor, uh, Brother Young, back home in Sacramento. His support, of course, means everything to me. So I've come all the way from California, through rain, delayed planes, a couple of runs through the airport, <laughs> to join you in exploring emotional wellness. And there's so many topics that we can cover in emotional wellness. There's so many details in so many areas. But today, I think one of the areas that might be the most important is addressing the experience of wholeness. We all know wellness, and we think about wellness, and kind of, you know, shalom, we know it means wholeness, we know it means health, you've had a few sessions on this, so I'm going to leave that to your imagination. But when we think about wholeness in general, we're talking about wellness, and vice versa, when we talk about wellness, we're talking about wholeness, They're the sense of being complete. Now, we know we need God for that, and he's given us some directions on how we can do that. So before we actually dive into anything, you've got your handout, don't worry, I'll reference it at the right time. So, you know, use it for notes if you want, but don't stress about following it right now. Um, but I'm sure all of you have had pressures of the day, work, school, things you've been doing, taking care of children, etc. So I want to invite you to start the practice of experiencing emotional wellness right now with me, okay? So you don't have to do anything particular, I'm just going to have everybody stand up real quick. And we're just going to practice a breathing exercise. God breathed life into us, and some of us have forgotten to start breathing again. <laughs> so I'm just going to say on the count of two, we'll go one, two, and then we'll breathe in. I'm going to pause, and then you're going to breathe out, okay? So let's go ahead and try it. One, two, breathe in, and out. And again, one, two, in, and out. Good job. Can we be a little louder this next time? <laughs> Remember, we're releasing all the stress of the day, okay? So in and out and in and out. And just give yourself a little shake. <laughs> okay, go ahead and be seated. Doesn't that feel a little bit better? <laughs> you know, we all laugh about shaking and doing these physical things, but God made us a physical being. The package of spirit and mind and emotions are all wrapped up in our body. You, yourself, and your body are the primary tool of ministry. And if we don't pay attention to it, then we end up with sickness and disease and exhaustion. And of course, there's other causes to those things, but a lot of the recent research, and recurrently, over and over, they're finding that those of us that carry the weight of everybody else, those of us that are really aware of the emotions of the people around us, tend to also have a lot more sickness if we don't have a regular practice of not just self-care in terms of like sleep and eating and nutrition and so forth, but of actually paying attention to what's inside and what we're doing with what comes up every day because otherwise we have a pile up on our backs and we gotta do something about that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But for now, um, yes, I am a licensed therapist. <laughs> a therapist, psychotherapist are usually pretty much the same thing. I promise I'm not a too much more crazy than the next person. Um, and I do have my doctorate in pastoral counseling. But when I'm talking to you today, I'm talking to you as someone on the same journey. Emotional wellness is not a place that we ever get to and stay there, like, oh, well, I just sort of maintain. It's something that we work for every day. And as Christians, that should be pretty familiar to us, right? We all know what it is to die daily, at least hopefully we do, uh, where we pay attention and put things down that aren't good and lift up the things that are right. And a lot of times we do that without maybe noticing the emotions that go along with it it's very, very easy to fall into what therapy calls intellectualizing. So we're going to be talking about emotions tonight, but I have a couple activities. Don't worry, I won't make you talk to your neighbor too much. But we have a couple activities that I would encourage you to, you know, drop the masks that protect you, the facades that come up, and just be safe. You belong here. You matter here. God cares about you and your feelings individually the good ones, and the ones that you don't think are worth paying attention to, okay? So I'm not going to be digging up anybody's skeletons, and I'm not going to be trying to uncover somebody's pain or calling anybody out, right? This isn't a sideshow. But I do hope you find some buried treasure that you didn't realize that you had in there, because that's what happens when we dig into our emotions. So 
why don't we go ahead and just start off, don't look at your handout yet, no peeking, um, but what are some emotions that you can think of when we think about the feelings that come up for us on a daily basis? Anybody want to call some things out? Gratefulness. Gratefulness. Somebody else said something? Exuberant. Exuberant. Yeah, that's a good one. It's a fun one to feel. Anyone else? Loneliness. Loneliness. Mm-hmm. They hear irritation? Yeah, that's a really common one for all of us, right? <laughs> Doing your daily day and all of a sudden something that goes, doesn't go right or you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. And stress, there's a big feeling, right? And that one crosses the physical and emotional barriers. It covers both. So there's a lot of feelings we can have, right? We can have loneliness. We can have uh, depression, by the way, is not always a diagnosis. It's an actual feeling. It just means feeling pressed down. So like all the good in your life got pressed on and you can't really access it anymore. Um, that's an actual physical feeling as well as an emotional one. Um, there's anxiety, fear, stress, nervousness, exhaustion, all kinds of feelings that we can have, right? So one of the things that's important about these emotions is to realize they're just gonna pop up. If you try to live your life without these emotions, it's not gonna be, go very well. And it's very easy for us to intellectualize when we talk about these emotions. So when we think about intellectualizing, it usually just means, oh, let me figure out where that emotion came from. Ah, well, I know where it is. Now I should be fine. I shouldn't have to deal with that anymore. And some of us as Christians might recognize it under a different name. We call it spiritual bypassing, where it really doesn't have anything to do with spirituality. It has to do with what we think spirituality is. So when we're thinking about our emotions and we're like, oh, well, I'm feeling anxious today, but, but, but God's peace, and I'm a Christian, so I'm supposed to have peace, boom. Instantly we have shame, regret, frustration, maybe even anger if this has happened before. And how many times a day does the, those moments happen where we say this emotion doesn't get attention? This emotion must be wrong, so I must cut it off and pretend I'm a good Christian and these emotions can stay over here. And the problem with that is you just bypassed God's blessing over here <laughs> because the emotions have a purpose. They have a reason, and you might have just walked away from something God was trying to help you understand from the tenacity and the patience and the endurance that we're supposed to build in faith because the Christian walk isn't just being happy and holy, right? It's being a full life, so sadness and happiness, strength and weakness. And in weakness, God shows his strength. But if we never identify with the emotions over here and feel them and allow them to happen, then we're over here cold. But God sits over here waiting to show up on our weakness. So it's a good reminder to kind of think about where in my life, because we all do it. It's an automatic mental process. If you've been knowing God for any length of time, you're going to want to cut off the parts of you he doesn't, he's not pleased by, that he doesn't encourage us to do. Because that's just natural, like, oh, well, I want to be all completely good. Not till heaven, <laughs> right? God can be good in you, and you can struggle at the same time. Now, we have the Holy Ghost to help us, to give us strength, to help us connect to those good things, even in the middle of the bad things but you won't know how God can show up if you don't allow yourself to experience these. So I'm not saying go on a deep dive and try to make yourself feel bad tomorrow. Please don't. Uh, you will need extra help. But I am saying when those moments come up, we don't have to be afraid of those. We don't have to be limited by those. We don't have to respond to them with anger. Now again, intellectualization, spiritual bypassing would say, oh, now I have the answer, I'll just remember it tomorrow. Eh, we'll talk about some tools you can use to not just experience the emotion, but to express it in a godly way and to release it. But first, emotions, don't mean you, emotions and emotional wellness don't mean you won't ever have negative feelings, that you won't be distressed by other people's emotions. Sometimes we're in a pretty good place, but we care about someone else and we're carrying that. It is not wrong to have compassion. However, if you take it to the point where you're carrying it around, but you're not carrying it to God, and you're not leaving it with God, 
then now you're not going to be able to help your friend for very long either. So it means being able to experience all emotions without being destroyed or stuck in them, to cope and grow with emotions effectively. It is a continual bringing yourself back to the spiritual baseline, to the emotional baseline that God would have you be at. So it's not about, oh, I'm only over here in the emotions, or I'm only over here feeling fine or cutting them off, but it's cycling between good and not so great, good and not so great, because you know that God can manage all those emotions. You know that God's gonna sustain you through them so you can experience them. So what does it require to do this, right? I can tell you all about it, but again, not gonna do you much good if we can't practice it. So, so it requires self-awareness, it requires understanding your emotions, not just emotions in general, but your personal emotions, and it requires a connection with God. Um, a famous theologian called C.S. Lewis wrote this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And I think he might as well just said a deaf self, because I think we all can be a little deaf to the call of pain at times. No one enjoys it. It's not very much fun. Um, it doesn't even feel like it's got a purpose to us, but there actually are. So far from being useless or a hindrance, emotions are actually designed by God to work the way they do. Now, would they have worked even better before Adam and Eve, you know, took the proverbial apple? Probably. <laughs> but for now, you know, there's a lot of people that'll say things like, well, I think emotions are the, the painful thing that came out of the garden. We wouldn't have had those beforehand. But I'd like to challenge that idea. How do we know God if we don't have emotions? How do we know what's good? How do we know what's bad? Emotions help us recognize what's valuable, what's working, what's not working. However, they're only informational tools. They're not very good guides. They're a little bit more like that annoying pop-up ad <laughs> that comes up on your page when you're trying to read something, reading a recipe or reading an article and that thing keeps popping up on the screen. Emotions are like that. They're letting us know something's available, something's happening. It's up to us and, our, and the Bible and scripture to interpret that correctly. So just because I'm mad at somebody doesn't actually mean they did anything wrong, right? Good to remember in an argument, but not always easy to remember. But just because I'm upset doesn't mean someone else is upset over the same thing, or even that they should be. Injustice, cancel culture, it says, I hate it, so you have to too, or I can't be friends with you. That's not necessarily true. The only person who gets that right is God, <laughs> and he gets to say, if you do this, it will not work for you, and I love you, and so I hate that, so don't do it. What we don't realize is it's not just arbitrary. It's because it just doesn't work, or at least not in the long run. So there's a lot of misconceptions about what emotions are. Um, so one thing that's really important to understand is emotions are physically based as well as influenced by your thinking. So anywhere between the ages of one to four, we get our temperament set at that point. Like all this physical studies, researches, etc., it's pretty much there. It'll get influenced by everything else. But it's pretty set at that point, your predictable reactions. You formed a view of the world based on your experiences with your caregivers at that point. And it's an unconscious one. It's sort of a transactional thing. If someone showed up for you and enough people showed up for you, grandma and grandpa and auntie and uncle and mom and dad and siblings and whatever, they're constantly there and they pay attention to you and your needs, not by yelling or screaming or ignoring you or telling you how to do everything, but also showing up and saying, hey, you cried. Here, come here, I recognize that you're crying. Oh, you're hungry, let me give you food, like responding to your needs. If that happens, then you can form a view of the world as at least partially responsive to you, at least partially a safe place to be. If that doesn't happen, or it happens and then the baby gets sick and has to go to the hospital, and it has to be away from that safety for a long time and then comes back, the concept and what we see in people's lives is that there's this sense of, I don't trust that good things will happen. And they don't even know why they don't because it happened such a long time ago. And it's just set in their brain because our emotions are based on neurotransmitters, hormones, how much nutrition you've had, did you have enough protein yesterday, did you have enough water today, 
all of that impacts your emotions. Well, from about one to four, and then again, from about four to 15, there's a lot of different mental developmental stages, and I won't go too far in the science, I promise. But I want you to understand that where we come from matters even if we don't want it to. Even if somebody is giving us everything we need now, it does not mean that what happened before doesn't count even if we don't want it to, even if we have been healed by God, it will still affect the way the brain works unless God decides to give you that blessing of healing the way your brain is working too, right? Your neurotransmitters, it's like the bones of your emotional system is in your brain, your nerves, and your digestive system. So if those three, any one of those have had an issue, there could be a chance that it's related to a need not being met. And it could be an emotional need or it could be a physical need. But by the time you get to be a teenager, an adult, it doesn't really matter why it happened. It only matters that it did. And whether or not you realize how that shapes your decisions. So the person who's shy may or may not be an introvert, someone who just wants to be alone. Or they might be somebody who people really haven't showed up for and it really hurt them. And so they're not so certain they can trust people. But if you don't remember that happening, then you won't understand that it's that. So, oh, well, this is just me. I really wish I could be like so-and-so. This is just me. Mm, not so much. You can do something about it, but you have to pay attention to what's coming up for you. Why do I do what I do? So that's leading us into self-awareness, and that's one of the major keys that we need. But for a moment, back to the underpinnings of emotion. I'm explaining why emotion is happening because we need to know that having a negative emotion isn't always a choice. I don't get to choose when I walk down the street and I see a certain color and style of car and internally go, who's that? What's gonna happen? I don't get to say, oh, well, I shouldn't do that and have it be very accurate or realistic because that was burned into my brain at a time when I was not very safe in my life. So I have to understand that, and then I can take it to God. And then I can say, God, here's how I'm feeling. I don't like feeling that way. I don't like when that happens. Help me to process this. I am safe in you. But if I don't understand that that's what's happening, and I'm driving down the road and I see that car and I'm <gasps> feeling like that, and I start an argument with the other person in the car, well, why are you doing that? I'm not realizing where it's coming from, so then now I'm an irritable, grouchy person for absolutely no good reason to the person in the other seat. <laughs> so it's not always that complicated, but it's also sometimes that simple. It's not always about whether or not you should have the feeling. It's about are you paying attention to the feeling and do you take care of it? Because if I have that argument with the other person in the car and I'm upset, well now I'm upset that we got upset. And now I don't know why my day started going bad, but now I'm grouchy the rest of the day if I don't stop it, right? And then you get to bed at night, and you're like, God, I had a horrible day. And, and it started so good, and I don't know what happened, and I, I guess I just failed today. Help me tomorrow. And then we stop it there. We don't go further sometimes. And emotional wellness requires you to step further than, oh, well, it was just a bad day, and go, is there anything that I did well today? How did I survive this day? It wasn't great, but what did I do good? And then balance it out and go, hmm, what could I do different tomorrow? And that's what leads us back to what happened. Now, if you're a parent, or if you're a teenager, or some, anywhere under the age of 24, your ability to think that way is still developing. It starts around 15, and it's solid around 24 or 25, give or take a few personal you know, discrepancies. So, if you're trying to think about your thinking and explore things, and, and it's hard sometimes, remember at between those ages, and even after it really, just for own support, but especially between those ages, you need somebody that you trust that you can talk these things out with at least once a week. Because if you don't, you're going to make your own interpretations of what that means and what it means about you. If I don't realize what's triggering my frustration or upset or un sense of unsafety, then I'm going to assume it's me. And most young people, and most children, and even a lot of adults, we assume, oh, well, my life isn't good because I'm a horrible, awful person. And we have two options. We can lean into that emotion and say, oh, man, I'm awful. And we usually see that represent as depression and anxiety. I am not saying people cause their own issues all the time. I am saying the felt sense of that 
over and over and over over time creates a new brain pattern that isn't very healthy, that does get very, very solidified. You can actually see it when, you t when they take um, activity or SPECT scans of the brain. You can tell what patterns are being used by the activity that lights up. And the activity that happens all the time, it's almost like you can watch a loop in their brain. And the amazing things about God and the brain is that can change. You can actually shift that. And they'll go back in five, 10 years later, they take another scan, and you've got a different loop. And the other loop either barely or doesn't show up at all, depending on your level of physical health and how your brain attach attaches to it. So that's true for even people in their 50s, 60s, or 70s. It doesn't just have to be young folks. So just remember, if you're struggling with processing some of these emotions, if you're going, well, I don't really think I have anything that bothers me, great. Also, take some time, pay attention, get somebody you can talk to. to and it doesn't have to be somebody official. You don't have to see a counselor, as long as they're a trusted, wise person who is already handling their emotions. Don't go talk to somebody that you know is struggling with the exact same thing you are. <laughs> You'll just reinforce each other's stories about how awful you are or how awful everybody else is. That's the other route you can go. It's unacceptable to me to think how bad I am, so now I'm going to blame everybody else because I just the pain of that is too much. And we're all kind of giggling about that. But it's true. Think about it. If you feel that you caused someone to be, uh, somebody's family to be broken up, if you, and you were five and your parents broke up, um, if you are feeling like, well, I never get invited to do anything at the church, and you feel bad about that, like, oh, well, it must be me. I'm the weird one. Well, it's probably not just that. You can step out. But if you've been taught your whole life that you're the wrong person, if you've interpreted it over and over and over that you're the bad person because you didn't have an alternative, then your story is going to stay the same, and you're going to stay feeling alone and left out and in the dark and in the corner. And of course, that's where the devil would like us to be, wouldn't it? But that's not where we have to stay. And feeling your feelings, noticing them, labeling them, paying attention to them is a big part of that. So let's go ahead and open up our handout here. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Literally, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So on the first page, it looks like this. Um, and I put my information on the front, so if anybody wants these files for their phone or whatever later on, feel free to email me and I'll send it to you. Um, or as long as that's approved, of course, by the folks running this. <laughs> All right. So when you look at this, it looks a little bit like a circus. <laughs> which sometimes our feelings can be that way, because you can have more than one feeling at a time. Um, but if you take a look at the middle, there's a number of feelings. Those are the feelings that are purely immediate, reactional. You have no control over whether those pop up. Well, you have the only control that you have is how much you ate and drank the day before and how much you moved and slept the day before. Outside of that, you cannot control what comes up there in the middle. You get to manage it, you get to channel it, you get to experience and release it, you get to learn from it, but you do not get to choose it. Those are happy, surprised, bad, fearful, angry, disgusted, and sad. These all are basic mammalian responses, if you want to put it that way. They're all basic to us as humans and to most primates. After that, it's all what God gave us as individuals, as humans. Um, so the second, sometimes you're feeling a certain way. Maybe you're feeling bad, but you're not really sure why. So you can pull out this wheel. You can look at it and go, hmm. After bad, there's four options. Bored, busy, stressed, no, tired. Ooh, there's the one. And then you go, hmm, how's that showing up in my life? I'm not really sure. How, how do I know that I'm tired the next time I feel this way? Instead of just thinking I'm having a bad day and making it about, oh, well, I'm not sufficient. I'm not capable. Oh, let me see. Uh, indifferent, apathetic, pressured, ooh, sleepy, unfocused. That's why I didn't do a good job at work today. I was unfocused. I was frustrated. Oh, okay, now, oh, I have another feeling. Um, let's see, it's frustrated. Let's see, where do I find it? Ooh, that's under anger. Oh, no wonder I got in that argument. So I'm being a little bit facetious, but not really. <laughs> um, I'm being a little playful with it because we have to be playful with our feelings. We take them so seriously 
as if this says something about me that I feel this way, and it really doesn't have to. It does if you let it. It does if you want it to. If you're under 10, it kind of does until someone else tells you it doesn't. <laughs> you need someone else, like a parent, uh, a Sunday school teacher, someone to go, wow, that sounds like that feels really bad. Huh, I wonder if there's something we can do about that. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm mad. I'm mad at so-and-so they took my toy. Okay, well, I, I feel like hitting them and getting it back. I don't think that's gonna serve you well. Why wouldn't that work well? They'll hit me back too? Uh-huh, okay, so what do we wanna do now? So you're literally walking with them through that. You've not shamed them. You've not said that's not bad. I mean, that's a bad thing, you're a bad person. It's like, hmm, will that work? Yeah, not very effective. What would happen if we did that to our own feelings? It works a lot better because our feelings don't make us a bad person. What we do with them might lead us into sin. <laughs> but the initial starting place, there is no right or wrong emotion. Even jealousy, we hear God being jealous in the Bible, right? It's just being afraid of losing something or not wanting to lose something you have. So is that bad? But is what humans do with it bad sometimes? <laughs> Most of the time. So when we can recognize a feeling, you can go here and it helps you to get a bigger picture. So it kind of gets you out of that locked in place where you're stuck in this feeling. And it helps you when you know what it is, you can know what to do. Like if I'm feeling bad because I'm tired and I'm unfocused, well, what are some good options for that? Any ideas? <laughs> sleep, maybe take a nap. Any others that could help since maybe I'm at work and I can't go to sleep? Take a walk, take a break, <laughs> take a nap in a corner where no one sees you. No, I'm kidding. Uh, get some water is a good one. Your tired brain will probably need extra water. You could have a little bit of dope sugar for that dopamine hit to kind of keep you going. Um, you can pray, right? Talk to God. Anybody ever done that? Just wholeheartedly, God, I'm feeling really awful today. You said you'd show up for me. I just need to cast this on you for a minute. What is it? Most of the time at work, they've done studies, and it's not always the job that is exhausting people, but it's all the stuff they're carrying when they're at work trying to think about getting that done when they're getting home instead of just being right where they are and being in the present moment. But we're not in the present moment because we don't really want to be where we are. We want to be finishing something else. And then we go to something else and we want to finish something else. And so then we have this Western capitalism leading us in circles. And so one of the things that's really important I think capitalism is fine. I'm just saying it's a little overdone occasionally. <laughs> we get too busy in production mode and not enough in being mode. And as Christians, our whole calling is not to succeed by what we do, but to be who we are in God. Let him be who he is in us. And that will lead us to doing what we need to do. But if we only focus on getting it right, which is what leads us to spiritual bypassing, right? I got to be right. I got to get it right. Well, even when we're doing it right, we're not the one doing it right anyway, right? It's God doing it through us, covering us with his blood, giving us his righteousness. So this is where apostolic or Christian support and Christian psychology is different from the rest of the world. The rest of the world has as far as we can get, as far as we can logically go, is detach. Do not be connected to anything. Do not be connected to any outcome. Don't be connected to any expectation, and you will find freedom. And, well, yeah, your body does feel a lot better when you're not attached to the outcome of every little thing you do. However, there, it doesn't work for very long. You can only stay in that space on your own for about five seconds if you can get to that, and a lot of us can't especially if you have a history of trauma, any kind of mental illness, or your brain just kind of hasn't been wired just right or doesn't have what it needs, um, any disabilities, that's not gonna be very, very easily attainable, if at all, for some folks. But we can all receive the Holy Ghost. We can all speak in tongues as God gives us the utterance. We can all experience what we feel in prayer when we truly give ourselves over to God. So. That's where we get to go beyond what the world has, and we get to go into something that empowers us. Because all the stuff we're talking about, there are some feelings that even as a therapist, I work in some secular settings, we're not as a therapist because we're not trained in Christian um, or religious aspects. We are not legally allowed to talk about somebody's faith or their spirituality other than are you filling your spiritual needs that you told me about yesterday? 
You can't really ask more than that because you're not competent because you weren't trained in it. Now, some of us are, fortunately, but as a therapist with a secular client, they have to trust me and lean on my opinion of them. And that can only get them so far. And then they have their friends and their family do the same thing to them. And then we go around in circles. So our ability to be well is based on everybody else's ability to be well, or our ability to be completely separate from everybody else, which humans don't do either one very well. We're not designed that way. We're designed to connect to God. So in those moments where you have an emotion that's intolerable, we want to do what the Bible talks about, which is pour out our spirit to God. Um, we see it quite frequently in Psalms, uh, Psalm 142, I pour out before him my complaint, before him I tell my trouble. Uh, Psalm 62 and 8 says, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And then it says the magic word, Selah. And that word, yes, it means a pause, but as a counselor, I get really excited about that word. <laughs> Because it means sit in, stay in, experience this moment, and what does that word mean to you? What does that look like in your life? It wasn't 30 seconds, okay, Selah. Okay, next line of the song. It was Selah. How do you feel? It's like when there's a holy hush at church, and all of a sudden you f everybody's hands go up at the same time, and you feel God present and healing and doing different things. What if we created a, just a little bit more Selah in our lives? That when something hits us that's positive, great, we do that really well. But how about the stuff that we think is bad or negative? The things that are really difficult and we physically feel horrible. You know, um, in the Old Testament, they talked about feeling like um, the, their insides were pouring out on the ground. That they'd had everything ripped from them. That they were being swallowed up. They're very physical feelings, which I have a wheel for. <laughs> I'm being a little playful here, but there are, if you'll turn it over to the third page, there are physical feelings that are attached to each of our emotions. This is why spiritual bypassing, intellectualizing, rationalism, the ways we typically try to help heal ourselves don't work very good. We have to have an emotional and physical way of responding to them as well. We have to sit in the feeling. So this is called an emotional sensation wheel uh, made by a colleague of mine. She's got her name in the bottom. Um, but it's called the emotion sensation wheel because it has the same things before, fear, anger, surprise, disgust, sad, happy. Um, and then the same second circle, all the information out about, say, if you're feeling fear, what would come out of that. But on the outside, it has a slightly different amount of information. And it talks about the physical aspect. For most of us, if we're raised just focused on getting the next thing done, being the best person we can be, I mean, it even happens in church too, because this is an automatic human thing. But we focus on the thing we're doing, not how we're doing it. And how we're doing it is usually a whole lot more important than what we're doing. Or in the case of when we're doing something for God, they're both important, but if you don't do the how right, the what doesn't end up getting done. So I can focus on discipling folks, but if I don't focus on how I relate to other people, I'm not really discipling people. I'm either browbeating them or I'm making friends out of them, but I'm not actually making a big difference. <laughs> not in the way I want to. So when you think about fear and you go out to a, uh, say unwanted, Physically, you might feel unsteady or you might feel cold because your nervous system recognizes fear as, oh, there must be a threat present. Automatic fight or flight or freeze kicks in and whichever one of those three you tend to do um, is going to start to come up, which is why we feel cold because the blood from our extremities is being sucked to the middle because our body responds physically as if threats were physical threats. So if I'm nervous about something, my hands are going to get cold, perhaps a little shaky, might turn a little purple, right? Those kinds of things that happen to all of us in different ways. Or maybe I'll get a headache because, again, the blood is moving from the extremities to the heart and the core in a protective mode to say, you might get hurt, you might have to run. Well, I'm not going to have to run just because I got nervous. It might relieve my stress, but I don't have to go running. But my body still responds that way. And maybe that's partly because God created us to be in a garden, not necessarily to be in a concrete jungle. 
Nonetheless, however and whatever the reasons were God made it that way, our body runs on autopilot. It runs on attempting to keep the status quo at all times. So if you're normal, at some point, whether it's childhood or adulthood, was reset to be ostracized, isolated, frustrated, angry, alone, or anxious, or any number of those combination together, then your body will fight to keep you doing and saying the same things that will make you feel the same way. Because your body doesn't care about how comfortable you are, it only cares about how same you are, how familiar it feels. So it's keeping the same way. If I'm feeling angry half the time, then I'm not gonna feel normal if I don't feel angry after a while. And so my autopilot's gonna kick in to make me feel normal. But my normal, if you stay in that long enough, you don't realize is not what's, there's more available. You don't have to be angry all the time. Um, you can do something different. The caveat here that most of us miss, and even sometimes in counseling it can get missed, is you have to feel and express and release that emotion or your body won't ever be able to reset the switch. I can't just be angry all week, go into church, get the Holy Ghost, and feel great for after church, and then hit home and expect it to change everything unless I participate in the change. I have to feel that, express it, name it, release it, and then move forward. So we're going to talk about some of the releasing in a minute. But first, we want to look at the example um, that Jesus talked about. And he said, those who mourn will be comforted, going forth weeping, bringing a harvest of joy back later. Mourning, in that word, a lot of times we translate it mourning over repentance, which is part of the story. Uh, but it also, the original word means devastated and broken like what happens when someone dies. And the mourning they're talking about is an expression. So grief is what you feel inside, and mourning is what you do on the outside. So he didn't say everybody who grieved was going to be comforted. He said everybody who mourned. Right? Everybody who poured it out. Everybody who expressed it. So when people ask, why does God let bad things happen in the world? Why, why is so-and-so allowed to feel bad and the person on the other side of the church feels great? My first question is, do they express how they're feeling? Do they go and seek support? Or do they keep it stuck in here? And sometimes we keep it stuck in here because we don't know how. We want to get it out. We try every way we know how to get it out. We whoop, we holler, we punch pillow cushions. But it doesn't really let it out because we're not expressing what we're upset about. We're just sort of having a cathartic release. But that doesn't take care of the reason the hurt was there or the anger or the sadness was there in the first place. We have to address that part and feel what that means. So there's no shame here, no judgment for tears in our Bible. God expects and even encourages us to experience our emotions. So I'm going to take the quick example from King David, right? Man uh, connected to God, everybody, oh, you know, good old David. Um, he and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. They came back home. They were away for a while. They came to Ziklag, which was David's city, and his men, all the people. This is before he's king. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters were taken captive. They lost everything and were not anticipating it, expecting it. They didn't know an enemy was in the neighborhood. It was just out of nowhere, right? And David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. That's the kind of feeling and emotion God's talking about. Letting it all the way out, not just, God, I know you can make me feel better. Please make me feel better. I don't got the time to feel like this. He understands that, and he will accept that if that's what you're giving him. But he can't give you something in return unless you dump out what you've got. So when I come to God and, you know, God, I'm just stressed out today. I feel like I got feelings. I don't even know what they are. I don't have five minutes to look at my emotion wheel. I don't know what's going on. I can, I can stop and kind of be like, okay, you can kind of listen. Just stop there. God, what's going on with me? And if you pause, you can hear God nudging you. Well, what about this? Or a picture will pop in your mind, or a word, or a thought, or an interaction you had earlier in the day. It'll be like, ooh, that's familiar. Is that this feeling? And you kind of check. Is this feeling the same as that one? Is this the same one I've been dealing with for two weeks? Ooh, is that a spiritual attack? Is that um, you know, the fact that I just never, I, I, I never apologized for that argument? I've been hanging on to this frustration for two weeks. 
and I just overlooked it because I was too busy. That doesn't mean you're bad for doing that. It just, well, you've got the natural consequence. It doesn't feel very good. <laughs> so when you make a daily habit out of using something like these, paying attention to yourself, where did I fall on this wheel today? Is there any big feelings today? You don't have to go through it moment by moment. That'd be like writing a journal of, I ate toast and orange juice this morning. You're welcome to do it, but if you, you don't have much time, it's not gonna be any good. But you can use this wheel, the second one as well. It's got scriptures for each of the emotions. So if you're stuck in an emotion and you're not sure what God says about that or what to do with it, this is a really handy dandy little item that you can look it up, look up that scripture and go, is that what's speaking to me? Sometimes the emotions you identify on here might not be accurate. You might identify, I'm angry and I feel annoyed, when actually you might be feeling kind of critical. So that's why looking at all the options under that emotion is important because you get to evaluate, oh, that one's much more effective. Or what did I do? How do I say that? Has this happened to me before? And you go back and you check in with yourself and you check in with what you've seen. Now, that's awkward at first, because if you haven't done it, it triggers all kinds of insecurities and I'm a bad person and I shouldn't feel this way. All the shoulds, right? You notice in the Bible, especially in the original language, you don't see the word should very often. You see could, do, don't. You see directions, right? Because God knows when we're overwhelmed, we don't even really need to understand the whole thing. We just need the answer. And if we can adopt that approach to ourselves, I'm not better than anybody else, I'm not worse than anybody else, God loves me, God cares about me, even when I'm a mess, I may not always have his favor and I need to go repent and get straightened out, but he still loves me even in my mess anyway. He keeps calling you and drawing you forward so that you can repent, so you can get it straightened out, so you can get refilled and get, get on your way without this burden. So it's important to notice that you can be inaccurate and check the whole thing, pray about it, talk to somebody if you're not certain. The more you do it, all of a sudden it becomes automatic. After using this little while, I don't even need the wheel anymore. I can either mentally spin the wheel myself, figure it out, or... I already know because I created a sense of awareness, I knew what was happening in my body. So if you'll turn one more page here, there should be a little guy who looks like a gingerbread man. Just a little bit. So this is for you to do at home, unless you have thoughts while we continue to talk. Um, but the idea here is to notice what you feel in your body when you feel a particular feeling and mark it on this little space. You can mark it with colors. I usually recommend pick one color for each feeling, put a little diagram on the side so you know, and then you can mark it and take two or three weeks. Just when you feel happy, mark where, that, where you feel that physically. Um, if you feel sad, um, you know, a lot of times um, people feel tears, they get headaches, lumps in the throat, that sort of thing. But then you might also notice that for some people, when they're angry, they get some of the same symptoms. So when you notice that, this is one of the ways of hacking, so to speak, your body and your brain, is you can interrupt your negative emotional pattern by noticing the physical part and doing something to either soothe your body, to move your body, to feed your body. You can do something physical to snap out of that state so that then you can make a better choice about what was going on there and not keep the pattern going. Or you can do it mentally, which I'll share a few tools on that in a minute, and also some of the wheels are part of that. But physically, you can do that by marking this. But if you don't know where you feel something, how are you supposed to figure out where you feel it and what you're feeling? You know, if you just feel bad overall and you can't find the feeling on here, mark what you're feeling here. And you'll notice over time which ones are going with what. Um, again, why are we talking about all this? Because God said, take heed to yourself. Pay attention to what's going on in you because you're the tool of ministry. You are the discipler, like we saw on the doors out there, right? You are the person that God works through. And if you're not in touch with who and where you are, and you can't do that honestly, unequivocally, this is where I'm at, but God, you're my resource, so I can, I can, I can turn this thing around. I don't have to be lost in depression or despond, just kind of feeling like, oh man, I'm awful. 
you can work on this. And these tools actually work when someone has a serious mental health issue as well. This isn't just for run-of-the-mill feelings, bad feelings. This is also for any level, because our brains work the same, the same cycle, the same interruptions. So one of the things that's important to notice when we go back to our story of David, weeping till they had no power to weep, David was greatly distressed. The people spake of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. If you notice, we know, most of us know that story. We know how that ends, right? He encourages himself in God. He goes and talks to God. Do I follow these people? Will I get my family and this town back? God says, yes, go. And he came back and he got so much he was able to share with everybody. That's what emotional wellness is like too. You get from God and he helps you to take back the ground that you either lost or maybe never even had the chance to have in the first place. And then you have enough overflowing, enough support, enough love, enough mercy, enough joy to share with other people. Whether you're sharing tools, whether you're sharing God's love, whether you're sharing prayer, whatever it is, it'll overflow on the people around you. The thing that's important with David here, though, we want to highlight is that he wept first. He didn't go get his family first. The first time I read that, I thought he was absolutely nuts. <laughs> Someone took my family, I'm gonna go get them back. I am not waiting to cry. Why wait to cry, <laughs> right? But you have to cry. You have to let the emotion happen. You have to let the grief happen before you know how to go get what you need to go get. Before God's gonna give you permission to move forward, you have to feel where you're at now. And you can't do that if you're running after going ahead, like, okay, God told us to go do this, let's go do this. Did, did we pray? Did we, did we check? Are you in a good position to do this? I'm not saying that we will always feel ready for what God tells us to do. More than likely, we won't. But our strength is from Him, but so should our direction. We want to make a habit of submitting everything to God. So what does it look like to pour out before God? It looks like David. It looks like letting ourselves experience the emotion. You know how we took those deep breaths earlier? Everybody was smiling, laughing, kind of awkward. <laughs> but when you take a deep breath and you actually feel it, it's like, oh, okay, well, I'm breathing. Oh, okay, no. Then you take another deep breath, and then you take another and another. You're settling in with enough oxygen to your body, to your brain, to be in tune with the messages God created your body to give you. If my body is telling me I'm angry, then maybe it means my boundaries have been, you know, overrode. David was angry as well as stressed out, right? <laughs> Somebody took his family. I mean, it kind of doesn't get a whole lot worse than that. Um, and, you know, we're laughing about it now because we know the answer, but he didn't. And he still cried first. He still trusted God enough to weep first, to be where he was, to move forward. Because for us, now I know there's a lot of details about that story, but if you think about it, he could have just gone after his own, which, you know, spoiler alert, go back. The reason his family got taken in the first place was he was kind of in trouble and not listening to God. Uh, but that's the, time, that's the story for another time. But the fact that he could cry first, weep first, be where he was first, and when we do that, it's a testament to our faith that God will provide joy and peace and it's still coming back. The reason we fear many times to experience our emotions is because we're afraid we won't get back to feeling well. Our nervous system does not like that experience. It wants to go back to normal. Numb it out, scroll your phone, be distracted. Distraction's a great tool when you have to use it. But we use it kind of a lot, right, in our society. And we numb out when previous generations would have been slightly bored, thinking, getting you know, illuminations from God, looking out the window, moving, talking to people in a train. My phone almost died the other day and I was on a long train ride and I couldn't use it. And all of a sudden I walked off the train with four brand new friends. <laughs> and I'm not exactly uh, sanguine, so that's not something I would have expected. But when you don't have your phone, when there's no internet and there's no Wi-Fi, what do you do? You end up talking to people around you. You end up creating connections and, oh, hey, you get to have an opportunity to disciple somebody and tell them about Jesus. So maybe devil's phones aren't the devil or of the devil, but maybe sometimes how we use them is a hindrance 
to being fully aware, not just of our emotions, but of the other person in the room. And here's the challenge, is when you're aware of what's going on in you and you've practiced it, you might be having a bad day, but you're familiar with that feeling. You know what? I'm going to pray. I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to recognize this is where I'm at. And you know what? The lie in my head tells me I will always feel this way, that I've always felt this way, that I'm not good enough, that it'll never change. But I know that lie isn't true. Because God says, what? I'm called, I belong, I matter, I have access to everything I could possibly need. Anxiety, depression, fear, anger, they all come up from a place of scarcity. Our human recognition, we are not enough, we never will be enough, and no one can ever make us be enough. And I can't say that often enough. <laughs> but I mean it, we're not, and our psyche knows that. So when we're up against important things that matter to us, the first reaction is either to attack the thing or back down, and neither of those work. And so we have emotional distress. However, when life happens and we didn't try to attack the thing, we didn't try to run away, it just happened, we still have an intense reaction to that that doesn't work because it's relying on our knowledge, our past history, our past experiences, other people's past experiences they pass to us, all of these emotions, and all of a sudden we have a giant wall around us that we're not reaching through to get to God, and God's a gentleman, he's gonna wait for us to open the door so he's standing there like, I got these tools, I've got everything you need, it's all right here. I just gotta wait for you to trust me. And he might even you know, poke the wall a little bit like, hey, here's some, here's some uh, spiritual treats. <laughs> here's a friend that you can meet. Here's this, here's that. Like, I'm sending it to you, I'm over here. And we're stuck inside that safe space because we keep doing the same thing over and over. And we can't move forward and we can't move back. And the longer we stay that way, the more serious the consequences. For most of us, those consequences start showing up physically before we notice them emotionally because that's what our society tells us to do. Charge for head until you drop. And then when you drop, let's all tell you how bad and how awful you were and all the things you could have done. <laughs> that's not very helpful. God doesn't do that. If you'll go to him, he'll tell you what you need to do. Not only his word, not only this people he puts in your life, your pastor, your preacher, the people involved there, but also he will nudge you when there's something very specific to you. He will tell you exactly what you're supposed to do and you won't be confused about it. You might be a little scared of it, but you won't be confused about it. And you know, that again, to emotions, they all have a purpose, right? Sadness tells us that maybe we've lost something or something changed and we're not enjoying that. Um, Frustration lets us know something didn't work. You know, there's a lot, depression lets us know we cared about something, but we feel hopeless to change it. So all these emotions are important and they have value. So what do we do with them? The Holy Ghost helps us. Reading our Bible helps give us a parameter to go, is this emotion accurate? Is the story I'm telling accurate? Um, you know, oddly enough, faith and emotion have very little to do with each other, if you think about it in a direct relationship. And I know that sounds crazy for me to say, I'm standing in a church, you know, making one of who's gonna strike her next. Um, but they don't, because faith can't relate to your five senses. You can't feel it, you can't smell it, you can't touch it, you can't taste it, and you sure can't see it. You can see the results, you can feel the results. I can feel peace, I can feel joy, I can feel hope, I can feel healing, I can feel all kinds of things. If I'm not right with God, I might feel a little bit of revulsion because I'm a little scared. Um, but I can't feel faith because faith is a choice of the will to reach up and believe God and say, you said this, I believe this, and God designed it so that he reaches down and connects the supernatural world to us when we reach up right here. So whether you feel faith or whether you don't, you kind of can't feel faith. It doesn't make any difference. So think about the freedom in that. Whether I feel good or whether I feel bad, faith stays the same. It's my choice to reach up and access, but it doesn't matter how I feel. I can have a bad day and still say, God, I claim that you said this good thing for me. I claim healing for myself. I claim healing for someone else. I can still speak good about God when I feel bad because my access to peace and hope and joy is always there. I will always get back to the place that I want to feel good eventually. And because of that, we can tolerate the not so great right now. And you know, there's breathing tools you can use, like we did earlier. 
There's writing that you can do. You can go for a 15, 20, 30 minute walk. There's things you can do physically to help you through the not so great right now. But the only thing that's gonna help you to be free of hanging on to the outcome of what happens right now is trusting that God knows, cares, is good at being God, and actually has a plan already. He's already got all that. So no matter what happens, we can be okay. And it's not based on me being okay. It's based on him being okay. So when we connect with that, it's so valuable. Remember, faith is not felt. You can sense the after effects. You can feel the after effects. But faith's not a feeling. I know we hear that. But what would that look like if you lived that out? What would happen to your feelings when you're feeling worried or afraid or, God, I really want you to do this, but I don't know if you will? Well, I seem to recall in the Bible, he said he will if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, which is far smaller than any atom in our bodies almost, just right up there next to it. It's just the smallest thing, the next thing's atom. That's it. <laughs> so the smallest thing, if you have a teeny tiny bit of faith like, God, I know you don't lie. Sometimes I feel like you don't tell me everything, but you don't lie. Okay. <laughs> so I can hang on to that faith. And I'm being a little funny because sometimes when we feel horrible, we need to shake ourselves out of that and say, this is a horrible feeling, but I have a good God, and I can connect to that, and I can believe in that. Even if I believe in it for everybody else, you have to believe in it for you. So releasing your feeling to him is a way of demonstrating your faith. God, I feel horrible. I'm not sure if you're going to fix it, but I'm going to demonstrate my faith by telling you exactly how I feel. Not just I feel bad, but God, I feel like no one cares. My heart hurts. I can hardly breathe. I'm not sleeping at night, etc., etc., etc. I have these bad thoughts that pop up in my head. Whatever thing you can possibly imagine, be specific with God. Not just in what you want, but in what you're not enjoying. Pour that out. Let that go. And you'll notice there'll be a release in your emotions. And even if you're afraid of, not, of crying and not stopping, I promise you, your body will stop. Three and a half, four hours max, that's all any of us can do, and that's if we're hydrated. So you will stop crying, I promise. <laughs> it's not very much fun, but you will stop. And you know, there's days where we have so much that people in life have cut off of us. They said, that's not acceptable, and they chipped away. That's not acceptable, and they chipped that away. And we try to please, and we try to squeeze into a box, or we get angry and we break out of the box, and we walk around all arrogant with brokenness inside. None of those things is threatening to God. None of those things can keep you from what God wants for you if you will release that to him and if you will allow him to help heal those things and give purpose to them. I can't give purpose to someone else's pain. They can't give purpose to mine. But God can give purpose to it by making it not worthless. There is no emotion you feel that is worthless. Even if it's just, I feel worthless. Hmm, interesting. So that's telling me the story you learned about your life is inaccurate because you clearly are worth the blood of Christ and there's not anything more valuable, right? So how do we challenge that? If you know what the lie is in your head, then you post literally around your house, on your phone, in your pocket, in your car, wherever you go, you put reminders that what God says about you is true that you are a worthwhile person. You may not be perfect, but you are doing your best. So you put those things, those scriptures, those encouragements everywhere you can. You play music that encourages you, which by the way, music has the power to change your mood simply by the vibrations in the music. So if you're feeling particularly unfocused, play some classical or some brown noise, either one. If you're feeling angry, play the opposite. For the love of all that's holy, play the opposite. Do not play angry music when you are angry unless you would like to stay angry and also get a cold in the next two and a half weeks. And it is that specific. <laughs> so anger affects the immune system. So all of us are broken in some way. We can get mad at the passages in the Bible that say, God pours all this out on the weak. God helps the small. God helps the broken. And on good days, sometimes we can feel like, well, God doesn't care about us and we're doing good but he does care about you when you're doing good. The thing is, you're just not any better off just because you feel good doesn't mean you're, you're strong. It means you might be leaning on his strength, you might just be having a particularly good day and you're fed your body what it needed, but we're all weak inside compared to God. And the good news about that is that means he can show up for you and you can feel him and be connected to him any old time. 
If there were an exception, then we wouldn't have that same access. So to finalize and draw it together, I want to introduce you to the concept of and. Like the father who cried, I believe, help thou my unbelief. He might as well have said, I believe and I'm doubting at the same time. And is the power of faith. We can be justified through Christ and still being sanctified. We can be fearful and yet act in courage. We can be sad and still have joy. These things are paradoxes that don't make sense except for Christ in us. It's something that just, and the more you practice being aware of your emotions, bringing them to God, bringing them to your awareness, sitting in that nasty, awful feeling like, okay, every time I sit in this and release it, I have peeled back the layer of the onion. I no longer have to heal that one, that I no longer have to feel that one piece of me I just felt. If there's a hurt that someone gave you a long time ago, and it just, it still hurts every time you think about it, take some time write about it. Talk to God about it. Talk to somebody else you trust that's not going to take all your frustration for truth about it and experience it, express it, release it, paint it out. There's lots of different ways. Obviously, I can't cover everything that would work for every single person here because it's unique to each of us. But express what's going on. And if you express it in a way that says, here's what I'm feeling, here's what I'm thinking, and here's what God's saying, the point is to close it with what you know God says. Otherwise, you've got op unopen-ended pain just flowing over and over and over. So the concept of and breaks the bondage that we have. It breaks labels and limitations. It demonstrates faith. It uproots fear and sets us free to embrace the right now instead of clinging to the past or being occupied with the future. So in conclusion, I'd like to walk us through a process that will take everything we talked about today and put it together. So if you have a pen, I promise it won't take long, but if you have a pen or if you're a pencil or if you don't have those, if you have a phone um, and you want to write, you can write the answers to these questions that I'm gonna ask you. And if you don't have um, a desire to write, then pick a space in the room to just to kind of softly defocus your eyes on just to kind of keep you in a stable space and think about what you're hearing and process that emotion, okay? So you might have some thoughts or feelings come up as we talk about this. If you feel uncomfortable, a memory comes back to somebody that doesn't feel very safe, I want you to look, if you have your eyes closed or if you're just not focusing on something, look around, pick a few things in the room you can name. You're among safe people. You are safe here. You are connected here. And God has got you, okay? Remind yourself of that if you need to. But in the meantime, I want you to take a moment and think about when was the last time you got really upset? Maybe you're really frustrated, maybe you're really stressed, really distressed, really sad, angry, down. Or you maybe felt stuck in a feeling you couldn't shake. Maybe it was over a relationship, maybe it was just at yourself, life. Go ahead and write it down, give it a name. If you don't wanna write it down, you can think about it, but I'm gonna to continue to use the words of writing for now. What did you feel in that moment? Was there hurt? Was there pain? Maybe sadness? What did you feel in your heart? What did you feel in your body? Was there anger? Was there a desire to run away? A headache? Just write down whatever happened. How did that affect you? How did it affect your relationships and how you related to people? How did it affect your prayer life? Maybe your health? What thoughts come up for you when you think about this event and those emotions? What thoughts come up about others or yourself? Try to think about it without judgment, just noticing what happened. We're not here to beat ourselves up. What did you do about it? Did you say something? Did you do something? Did you push the pain away with a coping tool? 
Did you embrace it and feel it? Did you get stuck in it? How did you try to protect yourself or stay within the familiar? And did it help? Did your coping do what you planned for it to do? What purpose did that feeling or that action fill for you? Were you needing to be protected? Were you needing to feel normal or safe or like everybody else? Were the thoughts or feelings familiar? Have you felt that before? When did you remember it before if it happened or is it brand new? What would life be like if you never had to feel that way? Have you learned anything from the pain that came up from the event about yourself or others? Is what you learned accurate? Or does it just go to build the same story your emotions and experiences have told you before? If you could have a face-to-face -face conversation with God where you could see and hear him directly about this feeling, about this event, what would you say? What would he say to you? Or at least what do you think he would say? What does his word say about what you felt and what you walked through? As you're writing or thinking, it's important to remember that God cares about our emotions and he never shames anybody. He welcomes us to share all of our emotions with him. He's not threatened by them. He doesn't shame us for them. We might shame ourselves, but he doesn't. He knows our frame and that we're not perfect. And he wants to help us walk through them, not just with prayer, not just with reading the Bible, but with a personal walk with God where he talks to you and you talk to him. Talking to yourself is part of learning to talk to God because you're being aware of the difference between you and God. Showing up fully means he gets to show up even more fully for you. Your pain is never deeper than God's love for you, never deeper than his solutions. It is possible to change these things, and it's not near as hard as your brain is telling you right now that it is. It's not as hard, I promise. So if you'll indulge me, we'll close with a sort of a mindful, guided type of prayer. Okay, It's something we don't always do all the time, but it is something that we can do with God for ourselves when we really need to imagine and to feel that connection to God, and we're just tired, exhausted, worn out, run over by our emotions. So if you're comfortable, close your eyes. If not, pick a space in the room to just softly focus on. And I want us to imagine ourselves in a room at the bottom of a long flight of stairs. And God is sitting at the top, but it's just you and I at the bottom. And you look at your hands, and you notice there's a bunch of feelings on the floor. In fact, the one you just wrote about. You've named it. You've looked at it. You've understood that it was an attempt to protect yourself, to keep yourself feeling safe, and that it didn't do a very good job of it and you probably don't need it anymore, but it's still really familiar. So you pick it up and you put it in a box. You put a little bow on the top and you decide it's not worth a bow and throw it away. And as you hold that box, you look back up at Jesus and you notice he's holding tools in his hands for you. One of them says new identity on it. The other one says a healthy emotional pattern that leads to joy and freedom. Another one says hope. Another one maybe says sleep even. They're all just waiting for you to go to him and he's holding them out to you. That's kind of sounds good. So you decide to put your foot on the first step and realize, oh, I have my box. Well, I guess, I, I don't know why I'm bringing my box, but I'm bringing it. So you go up the next few steps, and you look up at God, and you look at those wonderful things he has in his hands, the things you've wanted your whole life, 
safety and hope and connection, anointing. Maybe there's a calling in his hands that you've been scared to take hold of. And you keep walking up the steps, and you're looking back at your box, and you get to the top, and God tells you, pick one. Just take them. And you put out your hand to pick it up, and you find you cannot because you've got your hand full of your box. You remember you can't get rid of an emotion or a habit, a coping skill, without replacing it. You look up at God's face, and he's smiling gently at you. He's not angry. So you pick the thing you need, and you give him the box. And Jesus says, hang on a minute. And he holds it in front of him and asks you to open it. And you watch as you open the box, because now it's empty. Because you gave it to God and released it. Because you felt it. You named it. You talked about it. You experienced the emotion and expressed it to God. And you close the box, and you and God smile at each other. And you know you can come back to this space in God, this feeling, this connection, that he will always have more tools for you anytime you want. In prayer, in mindfulness, in scripture, whatever you need is there. And so you turn around and you give God one more feeling. Maybe it's gratitude. Maybe it's sadness. Maybe it's another feeling. You say, God, I'm not ready to let it go, but here's the IOU, I'm coming back. And you head back down the stairs. And when you get to the bottom stair, feel free to open your eyes and come back to the room with me. So whatever you left with God today, whether you wrote it down, whether you thought about it, if you feel like there's more of that emotion, that memory stuck with you, take some time tonight and give it back to God completely. Some of us don't like to cry or show our emotions in public, and that's fine. But give it to God in your secret space. And if you don't have a secret space, a prayer room, maybe start one. That'll be your first step to emotional wellness. Thank you so much. Well, I don't know about you, but man, that was powerful. Uh, I think every word that came out of her mouth tonight had meaning and purpose. And I don't know about you, but uh, I think I'm going to visit that staircase a few more times. And I didn't realize how bad I needed a psychotherapist. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I think these things are important. You know, the, the purpose of these, of these sessions and the, the personal growth and development class is to help us to, to be empowered as the people of God to do life well. And if you're carrying around a bunch of emotional baggage and just a lot of life that we all encounter, it's hard to do life well. And so when we can leave it at the feet of Jesus, and we've gotten lots of practical tools on how to do that, not just a bunch of rah, 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 and just go do it. I think we've got, we walked away with something that we can actually put into practice. And, um, you know, sometimes we think about these tools and things, you know, counseling and things. Some people think of them as taboo or like, you know, that's weird or something like that. But, you know, God gave us these tools. He gave us our emotions. He gave us um, wisdom to be able to handle things. But really, it's up to us and how we implement it and how we use it. And that's why I'm thankful someone like Dr. Uh, Chelsea has been able to take these, this, the education that she has and her walk with God that she has and to package that together and come help us tonight. Is anyone else thankful for that? Thank you so much for coming and being with us tonight. And... Um, and we're going to do a book giveaway. But before we do, I just, I just feel, I feel like we need to just pray. Why don't we just stand? This is our last session. We're going to close out these, this series. And let's, let's, just, let's just take a moment and pray and ask God to come down and help us with all these discussions that we've had for all these different sessions. We want to walk away different. I don't know about you, but I want to do life well. I want to have, cultivate wellness in my life. Can we do that? Lord, I pray right now, God, that you would come down and help me, Jesus. Lord. 
more than anything, God, I want to live life well. I want to be everything that you've called me to be, Jesus. Lord, I want to be who you've called me to be. And I can only do that, God, if I take these steps, God, if I implement the things we've talked about, God. Lord, and I pray right now, Jesus, that you would move in our midst, God, that your spirit would come down and meet with each and every one of us and meet us at our point of need, God. In your precious name, we pray right now, God, I pray that your spirit would take, would come down and walk with us through this journey of life. In Jesus' wonderful name, in Jesus' name. Well, thank you so much. Again, we do have a couple of giveaways. Um, we have uh, two different books. We have Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Who all has read this before? Okay. All right. So I'm not giving it to you. You, you're not. <laughs> so no, actually the seats are pre-selected. So we'll see if you already have read this, give it to someone else uh, in a non-threatening way. Like, Hey, you really need to read this. But, um, emotional intelligence 2.0 is a fantastic book in helping you get in touch with your emotions and learning how to navigate all this, uh, give you some more tools in your toolbox. And then uh, this is a, a book, I haven't read this, but my wife actually re uh, recommended this. I probably should read this, but Building a Non-Anxious Life. I create anxiety in other people's lives, so uh, you might need to read this <laughs> if you're around me. Uh, I'm a chaos coordinator, so uh, no, just teasing, but sort of. But uh, anyway, so this is a good book <laughs> to read. Um, and so I have on my left side over here, and I'm not looking, but left side, third row, not the middle. I actually, we branched out the actual left side over here, third row from the back, second chair. So one, two, three. So whoever is closest to that, actually, I think, Sister Cruz, I think you would be the closest to that. So, um, so we will, I'll let you, I'm going to pick winners, and then the first people up here gets first pick, Okay. And so I know that's, that's not probably the right way of doing it, but it just stampede, all right? And then uh, the middle section, uh, fourth row, fifth seat from the right. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I think that's, I think that's you, Sister Alvarado. Yes, this is like her third time. She is on a streak. Wow, this is awesome. <laughs> We're going to give you a whole library this series. Okay, wow. She keeps moving around just right. All right, and then um, far, my far right over here, I'm sorry, no, no, back, middle, row, left, two. So I'm sorry, back, middle, row, left, two. So that would be, I think, Sister Witty. I think that would be, you'd be the closest. So, and then I think you won one as well. Oh my goodness, There's, this is like a setup. <laughs> no, I promise it's not. And then far right, second row, third seat. So far right, second row, third seat. Actually, brother, I believe that's gonna be you. And your wife won as well. Wow, these people have gotten together and they have like subliminally put in my mind where they're gonna be sitting apparently. So I promise that I didn't, even, I didn't look. So anyway, so y'all come up and see me. We'll have a giveaway. And, um, and uh, you know, these have been good sessions. You know, one thing I took away from what she, what she said was, and then this kind of was kind of a, a theme actually through our sessions was, she said, you are the tool of ministry. We are, we're not just the temple of God. We are the tool. We are God's body. We are the ones reaching for the world. And if we don't take care of ourselves physically, if we don't, if we let insecurities uh, hold us back, if we uh, don't take care of our bodies and our physical health, if we don't get, uh, if we don't set healthy boundaries and we don't have good emotional health, we can't be an effective tool of ministry for the kingdom of God. We can't do life well. And so this has been an impactful series for me. And thank you so much for coming out and investing your time in learning about these topics and in these sessions. So thank you so much. You're, uh, be blessed. Don't forget All Nations Sunday this coming Sunday. And we'll see you Wednesday night. God bless you.